Alex, what's up, man? Welcome to the Dad Edge podcast, my friend. I'm honored to be here. Thanks, Larry. Dude, has anyone ever told you you just you have this cool radio voice, man? <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that once or twice before. When I was a kid, I didn't have a lot of inflection in my voice. So kids used to tease me and call me a robot. And so I used to listen to this guy. I don't know if you remember Casey Kasem with America's oh, Top Forty myself here. But I used to listen to him and repeat things the way that he said it. And so then in my 20s, people would say, has anybody ever told you you sound like Casey Kasem? So <laughs> it was pretty funny. Oh my gosh, dude. I, I, I grew up with him, man. I, I always remember him like reading the letters of dedication of the music that people would write in for be like, Kelly has a dedication to Robert. And when they grew up back in the day, Kelly really liked him, but she, <laughs> he never really knew about it. Like, it was just like, he was such a good. <laughs> and now he's finding out for the first time on America's top 40. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, so here it is. We're going to listen to uh, Billy Joel's baby's got blue eyes one more time. <laughs> but, no. Uh, but no, like, yeah, Casey case. I mean, I, I grew up with him, obviously the voice of Shaggy. Uh, you don't really sound like Shaggy though, like which is a good thing. So no, I can't, I can't imitate that. Just the one voice. I've got one imitation. It's Casey Kasem all the time. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, right, right. It's like you encapsulate the whole thing. So, well, dude, man, I, I number one, if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, you guys here in the audience, you'll see that Alex has just a kick-ass uh, studio here in the background. LED lights coming from the bottom. He's got so he's got a whole entire arsenal of books in the back, which means he he is an avid learner. At least that's the story I'm telling myself, right? Yeah, exactly. No, I'm I'm pretty obsessed. Yeah, I could tell. Well, let's let's actually start with some fun like little layup questions. The books in the back. What have been? What's one or two books that have completely changed the game for you? It could be in business, in life, relationships, or whatever. Um, I'll give you a business book and a life book. And I'm going to, yeah. you know, normally I say think and grow rich, but I've just, I've shared that on so many podcasts. There's this other business book that not a lot of people know about these days. And it's called the goal, just Ooh, the goal. Okay. And it's a book. It's, it's somewhat old. It's an allegory. It's told in the form of a story, but it teaches the theory of constraints. And Larry, it's so interesting because for years, I tried to learn the theory of constraints when I was in my 20, 20s, and it was so complicated and frustrating. And I, I was learning it out of textbooks, and I was running a pretty large business, and it just never stuck. And then in my 30s, I had a coach named Mason Ludlow, one of the most intense dudes ever. And he recommended I read The Goal. And the first like 60 or 70 pages are a little rough. It's kind of hard to get through. I kept coming back to Mason and being like, are you sure this story is so weird? And then after about 60 or 70 pages, it picks up and, and like the last three quarters of the book are super fast. But by the time you're done with it as a business person, you learn the theory of constraints. And it's not just as a business person, it kind of bleeds over into all areas of your life. So I've given away hundreds of copies of that book and people always come back to me and they're like, dude, game changing. It's like the best business book you've never heard of, but I think there's been four or 5 million copies sold. So yeah, it's a guy. Is that it? Jeez. Huh? Is that it? What a failure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, and organic, it didn't have like massive campaigns or anything. Even back when it was launched, it just continues to consistently sell. And wow. the author's name is Eli Goldratt. And so uh, it's, it's definitely one to check out. And then a book on life um, has to be the book Power Versus Force by and it's uh by david hawkins i've got his yeah. whole set up there very close second is his book letting go but power versus force is just life-changing you know it's 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 this book on how rather than using force like so many of us do especially men how we can use stay in our power and not have to raise our voice and not have to to like look in a way that's violent and not have to like bring more energy to the situation than is necessary. I always share with entrepreneurs, if you bring too much energy to solve a problem, you become the problem. And so power versus force gives you a lot of tactics on how not to do that. And it also has some kinesiology testing and stuff in there that's just been life-changing for me. It's interesting you say that because uh, I'm currently reading that book. I, oh, I, are you really? I am. Yeah. It was actually recommended to me by Carlos Reyes, who came on the podcast about a year ago. He's a, a just a ridiculously successful entrepreneur, amazing dad, amazing friend. Um, we've really gotten close over the past year. And he we he came to St. Louis a couple months ago. We went out to dinner and we just got on the topic of books. And he's like, dude, he's like, I'm reading this book right now, Power versus Force. It's like it's a game-changing book. And he started talking about 
all the things that were included. He's like, it's actually pretty complex. You almost have to read the book kind of twice. Yeah. He's like, but, um, but, it, but what he talked about was, oh man, I'm going to butcher it too, because you, you ever feel like you have so much information in your head and then you're trying to pick out that one piece of information. You're like, there's that thing in the book. So he talks about, I, I think it's like, I'm going to butcher the the terminology, but like energy octaves, right? It's like these things of like what sadness is, what anger is, what happiness is, what joy is. And, and the, am I saying it right? Like the reverberation, like the energy. Yeah, that it's, it's like the vibration of each yes. emotion that we have. And they calibrated those emotions. Right. And this incredible chart where you can see what emotion you're you are vibrating at and it once you've read the book and you understand kinesiology testing you can calibrate yourself and say like where am i right now yes and spend 10 minutes in meditation and raise your vibration yes and actually test it it's incredible well and here's the cool thing too um my background is in sports medicine with a minor in nutrition i took a lot of kinesiology so i, I have a science background right and so like my background hasn't really been like, I don't really embrace woo woo all that much. Right. I have a little bit of woo woo in me, but I was maybe it's woo and not woo. woo. It's like half woo woo. Right. But, um, so when I read this book, like when Carlos was explaining like the vibration thing, I was like, okay. All right. And then, but the way the book explains it, right. Cause you're right. It, they put it into like this scientifically tested, uh, container. Right. And, and like the energy and, and how it's, and I'm just like, wow, this actually has a lot of proof behind it. And here's the other thing too. We've all experienced this, right? In, in, in our community, in, in Data's Alliance, our mastermind, we call this the temperature control system, right? Which is, it's the energy you're bringing to your relationships and family, right? So like, for instance, if you're bringing impatience and anger, like a lot of times, like our kids, like the way they pick up on that is like, I don't know, something, something just doesn't seem right with you, dad. Or are you okay? You know, it's like, it was did you have a bad day? Or like they pick up on it without it, without any words, they feel it. Right. We all know those people when they walk into a room, we're like, Oh, it's going to be a good day. Awesome. Or they walk into a room and we're like, Oh, don't talk to dad. He's <laughs> right. And, yeah. and the way that book really maps that out is, is beautiful. So like guys in the audience, like, listen, if you have not checked out power versus force, I highly recommend it as Alex did as well. It's a great book, man. Um, all right. Well, I, I've got another just sort of fun, simple layup question for you. How many years you've been married? 20. Oh, no, sorry. Together, 20 years and married seven or 17 or 18 in October. We won't tell her you don't know. <laughs> yeah. Dude, okay. I do it every time. She's, we've been together so long that yeah. she's like, yeah, whatever. And she just answers for me. <laughs> okay. So what has a long-term relationship, you know, 20 years together, what are some, what are one or two lessons that have you've, you've learned that have been maybe uh hmm. maybe unexpected how about that you know larry i think this is this is a lesson i learned over and over and over again that is if something's important to you if success is important to you in any discipline, make it a habit. And what I mean by that is, if your marriage is important to you, if being a dad's important to you, if your business is important to you, your job's important to you, your health's important to you, create a process and a structure around it. And my wife and I, um, over the course of really the second half of our marriage, we did some process and structure in the beginning. We would always like meet in the morning and, and understand what each other was doing for the day. But really for the second half of our marriage, we've put a tremendous amount of process around our marriage. My wife, want, you, I, always, I always say, Katie always says, my wife once said, and I've repeated it a million times, we were in a mastermind and she said, you know, process in a marriage isn't sexy, but you end up having a lot more sex. And you know, the, the, the joke there was that like, if you put process into your marriage, it actually protects the marriage. So Katie and I align on a daily basis every morning. Uh, we sit down on a weekly basis and go through kind of a weekly planning routine. On a quarterly basis, we decide what we're gonna accomplish as a couple, and then we break it down by the month and sit down every month and look at it. We look at our net worth 12 times a year. You know, when you look at why most marriages break down, if you look at the top reasons, it's communication, and money and sex. And yep. so you look at those that list. And so we've actually put process around communication and agreements on money. And those those two things make it so that you don't fight as much around sex. So you feel a lot more intimate, a lot more closer together. And so I think it's 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 just the reinforcement of that belief that I have that 
if, if something's important to you, create a process around it, make it a habit. I love that, man. And <clears throat> you hit upon the three things that cause the most divorce, right? A lot of yeah, people don't. Those three. don't yeah, I, a lot of people don't know this, but everyone knows the divorce rate in the United States is 50%. But what a lot of people don't know is 50% of those divorces are due to finance finances and, and arguments and disagreements and stress and mis money management, and all these things. Uh, and that's just the finance thing. That's not including the sex thing. That's not including like uh, the parenting thing. Are we aligned on the parenting thing as well? Right. I think that's so important. And you're right. You know, it doesn't sound sexy, right. To add processes or even these conversations to your marriage. Right. It's more or less like, Oh, well, if we do that, then we're taking away the spontaneity. But the problem is, is usually the spontaneity never happens right? It never happens because we, do, we get busy, we, get, we, we do things. And then what happens is, is, in my opinion, is that a lot of people, a lot of couples then start to quietly expect maybe something or some things out of the relationship or out of the person that are never actually even said out loud. Yeah. And then they get quietly resentful because those conversations never happen because you know, as well as I do, that if you're coming together 12 times a year to talk about your net worth, let's just talk about that alone, right? You're going to talk about other things. hundred percent. Right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, that's just a foundational subject that we're going to be talking about, but there are a lot of other things like there's the parenting thing that probably comes up. There's the sex thing that probably comes up. There's what vacations and adventures are we having this year as well? Like there's a lot of other things that happen in those conversations other than like, let's just sit down once a month and talk about where we're at financially. Right. And you're right. It's not sexy to plan it, but the results can be very sexy. <laughs> <laughs> right. well, you know, I mean, I think you hit on a major issue in most relationships. And so because Katie and I have been married for so long, because we, we have our marriage kind of forward in all of our marketing and, and, you know, we go to masterminds together and people know us as a happy couple. I oftentimes get people who reach out to me who are having challenges with their marriage and they want to know, like, what can I do to make this better? And you know, what you just said is so important, Larry, I always share with people unspoken expectations are almost always missed. And until we clarify our expectations, we can't expect them to actually be like we can't expect can't expect them to be met yeah. and so with with a marriage i think what happens is you know at some point usually early in a marriage we don't communicate an expectation that expectation is missed we get into a childhood reaction of you know having an expectation being disappointed not communicating that disappointment and then it begins this long term like withholding where we're not really telling the other person how we feel and what's going on. And if you create a time in the day, each day to get together with your wife, you know, my wife and I use our momentum planning system that we use with entrepreneurs. And we share four things at each morning. We share where we were grateful for and where did we win from the day before? What's my intention for the day? So like not the to-do list, but like, what do I really want to get out of the day? Where was I uncomfortable yesterday? And what are the top three things I want to get done today? And, you know, when I'm sharing with Katie that, you know, I was uncomfortable yesterday because, you know, um, one of the kids was sick or we missed an appointment or whatever it is, you know, there's, there's a level of intimacy that's created in that repeated conversation. There's also a level of safety that's created in that conversation. And so this allows me to have a conversation about what's going on for me, but also so that she understands what expectations I have for the day and vice versa. And it's, uh, it's game changing. We, you know, I, I don't want to pry into your business, but I want to pry into your business. Okay. Feel free. <laughs> uh, can you give us an example? I know you gave us a few examples in there, you know, um, but give us a couple of examples in each of those categories, if you don't mind. Sure. I'll just flip up in my planner. Cool. So what I was grateful for yesterday was um, my family, the opportunity that we have right now and continued validation and confirmation of our content and our mission. You know, I got two calls yesterday about what we do as a company where we, you know, we help entrepreneurs like build teams, create their operations. We have a company called Simple Operations and we help visionaries get the help they need. And I had two calls yesterday that were super validating. So I shared those with Katie. And then where I won yesterday was I had a call with a couple of potential clients of ours named Tessa and Paul Webb. I got all my workouts done. I booked a coaching session for this Thursday with somebody who's going to be helping us with some stuff. And so it's just three things, three quick grateful fours and three quick things that we, that, you know, I, where I feel like I won. And then for my intention this morning was, um, and this is for the whole day, uh, have fun recording on the dad edge podcast and do what I can to help the men that are listening. Um, see what, how we can help 
Apostolos Siglas, which is a recommendation that I bought personally from somebody that we recorded a documentary with. Um, outline a solid nurture sequence for our email list. So I need to make the outline that somebody else can do and then get a solid workout and do some rehab on my lower body and wrists before the end of the day. And so that I can work out again tomorrow. And so I just, you know, it's, it's just putting down those intentions. And then where I was uncomfortable yesterday, actually, this was a really good day. Let me go to a, to a day where there's, there's some more stuff on it because yesterday I wasn't Okay, so a few days ago, I was um, uncomfortable that Kate, my wife's back hurt to the point where she really couldn't move. Um, Reagan, my oldest daughter, had kind of a lymph node growing on her neck that's that was puffed out, and she was on on screens all day. And I didn't spend enough time with my youngest daughter Kennedy that day. And so, and I write that down. Like when I when I feel like I didn't have a connection with one of the kids, I write it down because then that way it won't happen that day. How many kids do you have? Two. Yeah, Kennedy and Reagan. Reagan is 15 and Kennedy is 13. All right. So, and I love that, man, because we have four. And I find myself like, I would say I'm pretty darn proactive in uh, in the majority of what I do, right? I'm very proactive in my business. I'm very proactive in my health, the way I work out, the way I eat, all these things. I'm very proactive in my marriage. Uh, I think you and I have a lot of alignment that way. I have four boys. And mm -hmm. I will say that's an opportunity for massive improvement for me because what I find that I do is go to the shiny thing <laughs> when it comes to my kids, like yeah. who needs what and who needs it most urgently, right? That's some yeah. of, somewhat of what I do. Or like I find myself in these seasons where one kid needs something a little extra than the other. Like right now we're in a season that my 14 year old, my eight year old need a little bit of extra attention, you know, cause my, I, I won't go into uh, just out of privacy or we're dealing with a couple things with my eight-year-old, nothing bad, just some health related issues that we're trying to get a grasp around. And then uh, my 14 year old, cause he's starting freshman year high school and he's football camp and his first year of freshman football and that kind of thing. And I find that if I am not really intentional and proactive right now in this season with my older one and my youngest one, I tend to lose that focus and, you know, be more reactive. So I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. What, so somebody like yourself, like, let's just say you catch, right. You're like, wow, like I haven't really connected with Kennedy. Like I really want to, what, what is something you, you will, you will either do, or you've done in the past that you're like, you know what, I haven't connected with her. So I'm going to, I'm going to do this. What do you do? Well, for me, it goes on the calendar. Like if I realize that there's been a day or two where yeah. I haven't spent time with Kennedy, I'll like go look at her schedule. Cause our kids, we have our kids in Google calendar so that we can keep things straight yeah. and I'll go look at her schedule and I'll say, you know, Hey Kennedy, do you want to go swim tomorrow at two in the afternoon? Or do you want to go for a walk? Or do you want to go up hiking at the, the park that's near our house or, you know, whatever she wants to do or, or whatever she's interested in doing. Kennedy's super artistic. So with her, Sometimes I'll go paint with her or, you know, we'll just go for a walk, whatever it is that she wants to do. Yeah. But if it's not on the calendar, I find that I'm writing it down for a second day that I'm uncomfortable. And then a third day that I'm uncomfortable because it doesn't just spontaneously happen. Yeah. And so for me, it's, it's really like making sure that I'm intentional around it and I put it on the schedule. So we, we run a mastermind also for business owners, right? Kind of like you, where we, you know, I've, I've three other coaches that help me with that particular platform It's called dad edge accelerator, where we help dad business owners scale their businesses, create legendary marriages and create connection with their kids. Here's one of the things we tell these guys over and over again, show me your calendar and I'll show you what's important to you. Right. And one of the things that we do, and we've done this now for three, this is our third year in a row. We've done this at the beginning of the summer. And some of the guys, when we first, when we first announced that we're doing it, we're like, they're like, I can't believe we're actually going through, like some of the guys have pushed back on it. Like, I can't believe we're actually taking time for a mastermind session to plan our entire summer of adventures with our family. Shouldn't we be talking about more important stuff? And then they get it right. They, and they usually get it within like the first five minutes we start the session. We're like, you know, you only got 18 summers with these kids, right? Actually, if you really think about it, here's the, here's the crazy thing. We had one of our guys talk about this. I'll throw this out to you because I, I want your opinion on it. We all know we got 18 summers with our kids. Like that number in and of itself, you're like, holy crap. Like that's really scary, right? 
But if you really think about the interactive ages, right? I don't, I really don't think your kids really get super interactive and they know what's going on until like six, right? Okay. People always say, don't ever take your kids to Disney before the age of five because they never remember it. And they're kind of like too little to even really interact with it. But then you have the ages of six to 12, which is only six years. And if you look at that window of time, 80% of our one-on-one -on -one time with our kids is gone by the time they're 12. That's a scary thing. Uh, Todd Herman, who wrote the book, The Alter Ego Effect, came on the podcast and shared that statistic. So if you think about 12 to 18, you don't get nearly as many opportunities to engage with your kids as you did when they were from six to 12. So that's really, if you ever want to create a sense of urgency, you're like, holy crap, it doesn't matter if they're six to 12 or 12 to 18, you've got to capture those times and very urgently and very specifically and very purposely, right? So planning like your entire summer of adventures and things you're going to do. And I, I love that you put this on the calendar. My wife actually laughed at me last night because I put on my calendar from 6 to 8 p.m. tonight, play soccer with Lawson and Colton, who are my six and eight year old, and then take them to ice cream and then take them to fresh time so they can pick out their lunch for the next day. And like literally that's on my calendar. My wife is like, why is this on your calendar? I was like, because I know it will get done. Yeah, that's why. That, so do you, when, I know you, you work a lot with entrepreneurs and your thing is systems, right? Yeah. Um, how have you, how have you seen, one of the things you and I talked about before we started recording was how, how have you seen, you know, putting systems into your professional life and how that actually pays off in your personal life as well? Yeah, Larry. Well, it's, you know, if you look at the average business owner, they are, doing it all themselves. Yeah. They, even when they have a team, the team doesn't really take initiative or step up or do what they need to do to move forward. And they normally feel like they're in a place of overwhelm, overwhelm for time, overwhelm for what they need to execute, overwhelm for what they need to get done. And we show them a system through which they can plan exactly what's going to happen in their business so they can anticipate what they need next. They can communicate that vision, that outcome to their team in a way that the team can actually take initiative. And instead of being behind them where the business owner is always the biggest bottleneck, they can get out in front of them and actually accomplish without the business owner. And then we show them how to step into leadership through really clear systems around how you guide and, and lead people, not manage. Because most entrepreneurs, like including myself, were terrible at transactional management, but we're all leaders. So we show them how to step into transformational leadership instead of going like telling people what to do, checking that it got done, telling them what to do again. We show them how to set really clear outcomes for their team, um, coach success along the way, and they end up getting leveraged results. And, you know, I'll share one story from one of our members who um, I'll never forget this story. Uh, and I'll never forget the day that he shared. Um, so we were coaching a couple out in Florida that uh, runs a huge landscaping business, like a $5 million plus landscaping business at the time. And they came in with both of their hair on fire and their marriage in jeopardy. So that the reason I'm not sharing their names is I'm going to give sure. some details of this with where um, only our members have heard this stuff, but I doubt people will be able to figure out who they are. And so they came in and on our first call with them, they were telling us how the business was, you know, overwhelming. They didn't have any time. They didn't have time for their kids. They, their marriage was in jeopardy. They didn't know if they were going to make it. And we started, you know, we, we showed them how to implement some of our process and structure and how to get the operator in their business. That was not one of them, how to have somebody who's helping them in the business. It's not one of the two of them. And we had, like we normally do, we had this transformation in them in about the first six months that they were with us. And then really in nine months, months, they were so far from where they'd started. It was just like a complete and total difference. Um, they were holding hands at our events. They were, you know, sharing like how, how excited they were about what had been going on. And so we actually selected them to be on a panel during one of our events. And um, I remember asking the question, you know, what has been the biggest change for the two of you uh, in putting process structure and routine in your life? And the husband said, um, going around the circle and he started crying. And this is a guy who runs a landscaping business, service business, like tough, yeah, tough you know, dude. yeah, tough dude. Right. And I said, can you explain what going around the circle means? And he said, um, and he's like, he was crying to the point where we had to give him a minute so that he could talk. 
And he said, you know, I have two sets of kids. I have a 13 year old and a 15 year old, and I have a four year old and a five year old. And the four year old and five year old, they're young. And when we come home, there's a cul de sac at the end of our street. And they, they like to do this thing where they said, go around the circle, daddy. And, they, and I'll drive to the end of the street and we'll go in a circle like three or four times. And they like it because it kind of feels like a roller coaster. And he said, you know, before we had all these systems in place and before we got the help that we needed, the kids would say, go around the circle, daddy. And I would tell them no because I was in too much of a hurry. I didn't have time. I was thinking about the next thing that I had to do. And after we had changed things, I remember them saying, go around the circle. And I was like, of course. And I drove down to the end of the street. And as I was going around the circle, I started crying because I realized it takes like three minutes to do this. Maybe, maybe. And the kids yell and they laugh and they think it's like the greatest thing. And I had been telling them no. And he said, you know, I now have such massive contrast between what life is going to be for like for my younger kids and what it was like for my older kids. Wow. Yeah. And I remember when he shared that, Larry, like there was this tone of regret in his voice that was so strong that I looked around the room and I would say probably 60% of the audience had tears in their eyes or was crying. And I think so many of us were, were emotionally affected by it because we felt it. We didn't just hear it. We felt it. We knew, but you know, we all know that we've been in those times where the kid needs two minutes and you just don't have it, or you can't make the time. And, you know, seeing him recognize and realize how important it was and how easy it was, was it was it was game changing. We actually have that that segment of that panel in our members platform for parents. And we say like, hey, you know, we know what we teach to do is not the easiest thing in the world. Like putting process and structure in your business is not easy. It's not a 30 day fix. You know, we usually work with people for a year to 18 months. Um, but if you do this, you have time for this. And it's, it's an incredibly motivating um, segment. And it was really, for me, it was one of those things where I, you know, I know what we do is important. I see evidence of it all the time, but watching him on stage in front of the room, being transparent and completely emotional about it and sharing with everybody, it was one of those, those days that I'll never forget. You know, I, I want to get, very direct and, and very passionate on this topic because you got a guy, a tough dude, right? Uh, five, $5 million business. And by the way, what a blessing, man, right? For you to be able to witness that because it's such a lesson, not only to you, but you're sharing it with now our audience, which is a huge reminder and lesson to us. But here's what I'll tell you. Why do, why do we do dad edge? We do dad edge because of that reason right there. No man, no man should be on his deathbed or even in the middle of raising his kids and break down crying with regret, right? Yeah. But here's here's the crazy thing, right? Entrepreneurs, you serve entrepreneurs, right? And you do it very, very well, right? You help them with systems and teams and, and processes so that their business doesn't manage them, right? They actually can have a life outside of their business. So it's a beautiful thing what you do. And I, a lot of us men forget that. And we get to the point where our kids have gotten older or maybe they're out of the house and they're like, holy crap, like I missed it. Like, wait a second, can I have a redo? Right. Yeah. And this is where, this is where I really, really push back and encourage men to take a damn good look at this because it's so important. I read this quote a long time ago that some people are so poor, all they have is their money. And I'll never forget the first time I saw that quote because it was like it was a picture of this old man on a park bench with his back towards the camera, just staring out at a lake of nothing. And he probably had like all the money in the world, yet no relationships, right? No wife, no kids, no nothing. And I think that that's a huge miss for men is that and, and here's where I'll bring it back to the calendar aspect, right? I'll say this one more time, which is show me your calendar and I'll show you exactly what's important to you. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think if you don't schedule these things, if you don't take action, if you don't take initiative, these years will slip away. What, one quick story and example, and then I want to get to some more topics that we're going to discuss. My 14 year old, he's starting, you know, he's my second born. He's starting freshman year this, this year. He's very stoic, um, tough kid. He's been playing football for like five years. You know, it just doesn't turn his back to anything competitive. You know, he's just one of those kids. 
And what I've noticed is the older he gets, he's spending more time with friends, which is totally normal. But I also noticed that it's a little harder to talk to. He's a little bit harder to talk to than, than most, right? And he doesn't really reveal a whole lot unless it's super important to him. So this, this year, two years ago, I took him, him and his brother to um, disperse camping in the Colorado mountains and Twin Lakes. We're like literally pooping in the woods camping, right? And I didn't know how he was going to like that, but he turned out he loved it. He and I were watching Forrest Gump the other night. And we kind of were talking between, between scenes and this kind of thing. And, and I'm like, Hey, like, you know what, if you could do one thing before the end of the summer, what would it be? And what he told me surprised me. He's like, are we going on a camping trip like that again this year? And I was like, I don't have one scheduled. He goes, and he just kind of remained quiet for a second. He goes, I'd really like to do that with you. And I was just like, and it was almost like this, this nudge, right? It was almost like a little punch in this, in the arm, even like, go schedule that he's yeah. asking you for it. And next year he might not be asking you for it. So you better schedule it. So I literally have been online this morning checking out, you know, where I can rent all my cap camping gear because we, we brought it all the, the year before last and it was a such a pain in the ass. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of like, Hey, I, I need to answer this nudge. Right. And do it right. Because I might, this might be the last time he asks right before he's out of here. So I, I want to do it with him. But going back to, you know, you as a businessman, marriage, you know, you talked about marriage and some of the things you've learned. Two kids, how old are your kids? Um, so Kennedy is 12 and Reagan is 15. Wow. So preteen. Kennedy's about to be 13. Yeah. Next month. So what have these two kids taught you about fatherhood and what have they taught you about yourself? Dude. You know, I remember the day that Reagan was born. We had both of our kids at home and Katie had been in labor for like 39 and a half hours. Oh my God. Yeah. It's like a work week, man. It was a big deal. It was huge. And um, Reagan was born. I was the second human to touch her because the, the midwife who was there caught her and then handed her to me and I wrapped her up in a towel and um, well, actually wrapped up in a towel and then we waited for the placenta to, to get born. And we did like the whole natural thing where you keep them together for a little bit. And I walked out with Reagan wrapped in a towel into the hallway because they were making sure Katie was okay. And, and they were doing stuff and, and Nedra, who was an acupuncturist who was with us, not the midwife. She said, you know, why don't you walk her out in the hallway and spend a second with her? And I remember walking out in the hallway and thinking how everything had changed. Like when you say, what have your kids taught you? You know, I would say that my kids have shifted perspective, but I would also say that they changed the definition of perspective. You know, I think when I, when I looked down at Reagan that day, I'm, it's like, this is real, you know, this, th there's, there's no manual here. <laughs> there's no, there's no instruction book. Like this is, this is the most important thing that I'm ever going to do. And I felt it. And, um, I had a very similar feeling when Kennedy was born that Kennedy was born at home too. And Katie had some complications and actually passed out right after she gave birth. It was kind of scary. She went down like, yeah, like quick. And that time the midwife handed me Kennedy and was like, go out of the room, you know? And so it was not a, not a comfortable so situation. Yeah. It was scary. It was yeah, scary. Yeah. And I saw her getting out a medical kit and a syringe and I'm like, Oh Jesus. So I walked out in the, in the other room and I, I actually walked outside. We had somebody there helping us with Reagan because she was at home as well. And I sat down on the front doorstep with Kennedy. I just had to get outside for a second. And Reagan came running up and she's like, Kennedy, you got born. And it was you like, born. <laughs> you got born. it was the cutest thing ever. And, you know, here, here's, here's, I think that my, if, if you want the biggest lesson that I've learned from my kids is that nothing important will happen for you without intention. And I think that, you know, there's so much spoken about intention in the world. Like, what is your intention? I read this book by um, Wayne Dyer called The Power of Intention when I was younger. I've given away hundreds of copies of it. At one point, Katie and I even had the opportunity to meet Wayne Dyer. It was amazing. Wow. Yeah, he's such an incredible dude. Like, crazy story how we met him, but just an incredible human being. And I read that book and you know, he, Dyer convinces you that intention is so powerful, but there's not a lot of tactics there. Yeah. And so, you know, for me, what I realized was kind of what you said, I was actually in a coaching session, probably 12 years ago, something like that with a guy named Kirk Dando. And he said, and we were right in the middle of 
um, you know, talking about growing my business. And he said, Alex, can I ask you a personal question? And I said, sure. And he goes, what's the most important thing in your life? And I said, well, that's easy, Kirk. It's my wife and kids. And he goes, great. Let's take out your checkbook and your calendar and see if we can prove that out. And it was like in the middle of this other conversation, I'm like, Kirk, what are you doing? Because in the back of my mind, I'm like, I don't think I want to take out my checkbook and my calendar. It's not going to show yeah. the right thing. Right. And, wow. And so, so that conversation changed so much for me. I was like the next day, all right, intention. What am I going to actually do to create the relationship that I want with both Katie and with my kids? What else can I add? What else can I do? Like every day we get up and we go on a family walk. It's about 20, 25 minutes, but it happens every single day. So there's like this opening to the day where we're all together and it's not just like running around the kitchen and eating. And, you know, there's, there's a high level of intention and just doing that. You know, some days there's not a lot of conversation. Some days there's so much, it's a little overwhelming. Um, you know, we create an intention around everything we do. I, I intentionally seek to be the parent that the kids all like to hang out with because Reagan's 15, you know, and, and at 15 years old, she wants to spend a ton of time with her friends. So we have the house where the kids all like to hang out. And so the kids are here all the time. This weekend, we went, we, my, my kids have been driving since they were like two and a half years old. I like to drive race cars. So I like bought them little go-karts when they were kids. They absolutely love like going to the go-kart place. And so we went, but we went with a friend of Reagan's and he came and raced with us and she absolutely annihilated him on the, uh, annihilated him on the track and she was super proud of herself. And, but you know, it's, it's, I create a, a, a the, the lesson is like, if you really want something, then there has to be a plan and a structure and a high level of intention around it. But just intention alone is not going to get you there. It's, it's intention with structure and routine so that you can actually have the outcome that you want. And I think my kids have, have, you know, I think I knew that before I had kids now with kids, it's been reinforced at such a high level that, that it's um, something I think about all the time. That's awesome, man. I love that. Um, and I love the fact that you have made your house like the house, right? We, we actually have done the same. Uh, we, we wanted our kids to, to bring their friends here. It's like this blessing and curse. Right. Because like, dude, there are times like on July 3rd, I'm not even kidding. Like we have four boys. Right. And I think at one point we had like 19 kids here. I'm just like, I don't, I lost count. All I know is, is I ordered 10, 10 medium pizzas from Domino's because that's like the best deal I could find for six 99 to feed all these people. And they were all gone, Alex, all of them. I'm like, holy crap, people. I was like, we went through 80 slices of pizza. Like that's a lot of pizza, right? But then again, we had a lot of kids over. I think that's so cool though, because like it's it's a blessing and a curse because you always know where your kids are at and you, and you got the kind of like the cool house, right? You got the fun house. Although I my, my boys have told me that all their friends are scared of me. They're like, oh, <laughs> which, I, which I find kind of fascinating because I don't think I, I'm really that all intimidating of a person, right? I, I I actually pride myself on being a friendly person, but all, all of my, my boys' friends have been like, oh, dude, I would hate to make your dad angry. Like, right? <laughs> and I'm just like, but, you know, they still come over and they still eat all of our food. Um, but I, I love that you do that. Um, I, I also, I, I really want to get to um, ha what, what I like to call having it all, right? A lot of men will think like, and let's just, let's take three areas. Yeah. Um, you've got business. Or for our guys who don't own businesses, you got career, right? You have marriage, which is a big one, right? And then you have the connection with your kids, all three. And let's also bundle in a fourth. Let's let's bundle in finances. We can be successfully, we can be profitable, we can make we can make good money. But a lot of guys are are under the impression, well, it's really hard for me to have a family life if I'm a career guy. Mm -hmm. I used to I used to work for corporate America. I used to be a medical device sales, and I was upper executive management team where we were on the road constantly. And what I can tell you is I literally got up to the point where I was so unbelievably bored with the BS dinners with our executive management team. I literally just, th there were times, Alex, I'm not even kidding. I just wanted to get up and be like, Hey guys, uh, yeah, I'm out. I quit. I'm, I'm done here because what I could tell from the majority of people who were at that table is we all made great money. And every single person at the table, except for me, was like, oh, I just love traveling. I just got to get the hell away from my family. I was like, what are you smoking? Like, what's wrong with you, man? Like, or, or woman, right? Like, I'm like, 
I can't stand being here with you people. Like I would rather be home. <laughs> so, you know, but, but here with you. what's that? <laughs> yeah, I'm barely here with you. people. <laughs> right. fact, are you all even talking? Cause yeah. But anyway, uh, a lot of us are under the impression that why in order for me to have a successful career, then I, I probably can't have a successful family. Well, if I have a successful family, then I probably can't have a successful career. If I have a great marriage, then maybe I'm not going to be the best parent, or maybe I'm all dad and no husband, right? And I neglect my marriage and I'm all about my kids. So how do we find, and I hate the word balance, can't stand it. I like optimization, but how can we have it all? It's funny, you know, that you said that. So Larry, I gave this out on my wedding day. I don't know if you can read it. It's backwards, but it says you can win them all. Oh. And I gave it to all of my groomsmen, this plaque that says you can win them all because we have this belief in society that everything is a trade-off and that we can't integrate where we want to be successful. So I told all my groomsmen that day, we should all maintain the delusion that we can win them all because then we will. And if we create the intention around winning everywhere, then we will. And, you know, when I look at that, that, that balance that people talk about, I'm glad that you said you don't like that word, because when I think of balance, I think of somebody walking on a tightrope without a net. Yeah. Oh, and I think so many of us actually have that image, like, or a similar image or a similar feeling, maybe a similar physiological effect. When somebody says balance, I remember when I was younger and somebody would say balance, it would make me feel guilty. I would think like, how do you balance it all? Like how, what, what secret do you have that I can't figure out? And what I learned over time was that just that seeking of balance can actually be one of the most difficult like riddles in your life. And so I seek to integrate and, and like, where do I create work-life integration? Where do I create work-family integration? You know, we, we have this concept we call the three alignments and it's the three alignments for an entrepreneurial personality type to be able to success, be successful in life. Very similar to what you said for us, it's the alignment with yourself, the alignment with relationships, which is driven by the alignment with your family and your, your spouse and your kids, and then the alignment with your business. And when you examine those three areas, like, what do I want in the relationship with myself? What do I want for myself? Like you said, you know, I, I work out a lot. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to be 50 this year and I'm determined that I will not start to degrade and will not start to, to lose that physical edge. And so in my alignment with myself, it's a lot about health. It's a lot about working out. It's a lot about movement. Then my alignment with my family, I've already shared a lot of that. And then the alignment with the business is, you know, I want to be doing something that I'm really excited about doing every day because Katie and I fortunately have, have worked to the point where we don't have to work every day. Like I can't say I have to go to work anymore. We really don't. We could survive on what we have for indefinitely, especially if we change the way we're investing for more revenue, we could, we could definitely survive invest indefinitely. And so for me, it's, it's really having that massive amount of alignment with those three areas. And I think that the foregone conclusion that you can't drives the reality that you won't. And when we are willing to create the possibility that we can, we start saying things differently. And I've been to so many of those dinners you described, Larry, so many when I was younger in my 20s, I ran a manufacturer's rep firm. This was before I was married. And I would often host those dinners. I was a guy who, you know, we'd be in country somewhere on a, on a tour of real re retail companies, or we'd be, you know, meeting with tech data or with office depot or someplace like that. And then afterwards you have that obligatory, we're going out to dinner and I'd be sitting there with, you know, five or six men, mostly men. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Seriously, dude. mostly men, sometimes, sometimes men and women, but, but that industry was dominated by men at the time. And I would sit there listening to them complain about their wives, complain about their kids, just like you said, like, so happy to be on the road again, like they were escaping something. And I remember thinking like, you know, I'm pretty sure that's how my dad felt when I was younger, because he spent a lot of time away from home. And I'm like, I never want to be in a situation where I feel like I need to escape my family. And, you know, that it's part of the reason I don't travel a lot on business. Now it's part of the reason I don't do a ton of masterminds unless they're super important. And oftentimes when we do, the kids are with us. You know, we'll go to a city and they'll, they'll go out and like take tours and do stuff during the day. And, and we, we I, I seek to integrate wherever I can. And so I think the most important thought for me is as soon as I have declared something impossible, then it is. And so I, I always, you know, 
I always try and maintain that, that possibility that I can integrate, that I can run a successful business, that I can have a successful marriage, and I can have a relationship with my kids that today is connected as father-daughter and that tomorrow will turn into friend and advisor. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm unwilling to believe that that's not possible. Yeah. You know what? I, I love that because you're exactly right. You know, it, it, we're talking a lot about memes, but it's so true that um, I have a good friend of mine who's also one of my nutrition coaches and a good friend, and he posted on his Facebook story, uh, the reason you can't get to your goals is because you keep telling yourself the story of why you can't. Yeah. And, and that's so true, right? It is so true. It's like, uh, you know, we, we had... <laughs> We had a guy, a random guy in our dad edge group. Uh, we have a group on Facebook that has like, I don't know, like 20,000 dads in it. Right. Mm. And, um, and one guy, just random guy posted, what's your number one struggle, you know, with being a father and dude, there were well over 150 comments on this guy's post and mm. all of the, like the, the theme of these things were the story that these men were telling themselves. Like that, that was the overall, I, I could go into specifics, but I'm not, but like every, almost all the comments had a theme of, you could tell it was a story that a guy was telling himself. Like there was one guy that ranted about how his biggest struggle is his job and his employer and his employer's terrible. And he's this, and he's that, and, and he hates his job. He hates what he does. He despises. And my first thought is like, why in the hell are you working there then? You you have the power to choose. You can go into a totally different career if you really, really want to, right? I mean, a lot of people think they're, and trust me, man, 10 years ago, I was that guy, right? I'm in medical device. There's nothing else I can do in the entire world besides medical device. That's all I know. Biggest lie I ever told myself, right? I mean, like, it's the stories that we tell ourselves of why we can't have what we truly, truly want is the reason we don't have them. If we told ourselves a different story, a lot of people don't realize this, you do and I do, which is our words have power, right? Our words have power. If we want to create an extraordinary marriage, like fast forward of what are you going to be celebrating in, in a month from now, three months from now, six months from now, right? What are the things that you can do to create an extraordinary marriage? Not the laundry list of reasons why you can't, right? Yeah. Because we all have those, right? I think it's awesome, by the way. So freaking cool, man. You're going back almost 20 years. You still have that plaque that you held up. And if you're watching us and you hold that up again, man. that is the coolest thing ever. You can win them all. That's going to be the name of the show. I think you can yeah, win them October all. October 1st, 2005. So that's when Katie and I were married. That's so I so nailed cool, it. Man. Yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah, you did, man. Even back then. Right. Um, that's so cool. Wait, let me ask this. Um, you know, we, we're, we're wrapping up the show here, but I want to, I want to go back and, and ask you a question here. Um, how old are you? 49, which is crazy to me. You look so young, man. Well, thank um, you. I just turned 47 two days ago. So, um, well, dude, you're not doing so bad yourself, Larry. Thanks man. Thank you. Uh, I, I guess some good genetics in there and a lot of healthy food, a lot of water too. Uh, but I want you, I, I want to go back to Alex one year before marriage. Let's just say 21 years ago. What's your wife's name again? Katie. Katie. Let's go back to a year before you and Katie got married. Okay. And let's go back to, let's just say um, 28 years old, Alex. Okay. And here you are, 49 years old, Alex. You call yourself on the phone, right? You now call yourself 28 years ago. Be like, hey, man, it's me from the future. 21 years from, from now. I want to take you out to dinner. We have one hour to spend together. I'm going to take you out to dinner and I'm going to give you some words of wisdom, some advice, and some things to think about as you think about your life over the next 20 years. Okay. You want to go out to dinner? And of course, your younger self is like, yeah, man, I'm all about it. So you sit down with yourself. You're literally face to face with yourself at 28 years old and 49 years old. And you're like, all right, man, here's the deal. What would you say to yourself? Um, anything that's important to you is not going to be easy and there's no perfection in marriage. And I think that, you know, in those early days of a relationship, we all have this, this chemical concoction that's pumping so much of what's going on, you know, with the oxytocin and the serotonin and the dopamine that's just dumping all over the place. And, 
um, once you get married, there's, you know, there's a reality that sets in that like, you know, you're with somebody and you're with them a lot. And there's, there's not a marriage that I've ever met or talked to or, or been around, you know, and people who are married that I've ever been around that, that will not tell you that they've had struggles and they've had challenges. And for me, I think I would sit down with that younger self and say like, Hey, it's okay. It's okay to have struggles. It's okay to have challenges. It's okay to have disagreements. It's not, don't focus on the, the struggle, the challenge or the disagreement, focus on how you resolve them together and how you make that, how you allow that to make you stronger as a couple. And, um, I think, I think that's super important because if you go into marriage with this idealized outcome that somebody's going to always understand you and always anticipate what you want and always be, you know, behaving in a way that you want them to and always um, show up in a way that makes you feel good, then you're not being realistic about the fact that there's a whole nother human being there. And when you understand that there's another person that has their own needs and you know the more intentional you are with that person the more you communicate with that person the more you understand about that person the easier things get i think that's what i would have told myself because i as a kid my my parents had a i think they had a decent marriage but there wasn't a lot of communication my dad traveled a lot he wasn't there a lot my mom used to take us to take get family pictures by ourselves my dad like if you look at all of the family pictures I have from when I was a kid, you'd think my mom was divorced, but she wasn't. She just, my dad just wasn't ever there. So we used to do family pictures, the four of us with my mom. And so I didn't have a, I, I had an okay example of what it looks like for a couple to stay together. They never got divorced, but I didn't really have an example of what it should be and what it can be. And, you know, I think I would tell my younger self that every time I encountered any level of constraint or resistance in my marriage. It was a massive opportunity and it has been, I didn't see it at first, but it has been now like anytime there's been constraint or, or struggle or frustration or any of that in our marriage, it has always created an opportunity, an opportunity for growth, an opportunity for us to be closer, an opportunity for us to learn much deeper life lessons and an opportunity for us to support each other in a way that we're really creating the life we want. Man. I, the, the thing that I love about that answer, Alex, is how real it is, you know, <laughs> and, and how, and what solid advice. I mean, think about that for a second, right? What if it wasn't you that sat down with you, but you had a mentor who is 20 years ahead of you and gave you that advice? Yeah. Like how freaking cool would that be right to have that type of advice, you know, going into marriage? Because I, I mean, I, I, I'm celebrating 20 years next year. And I can tell you, um, I would say my, my wife comes from a lineage, generations, no one in her family has been divorced mm. ever. Like we're talking two, three generations back. No one has been divorced in her family. And I took my, and, and my wife is one of those people, man, she is loyal as the day is long. She ain't going anywhere. Right. I'd probably have to beat her for her to leave. Right. <laughs> And when I, I took my wife out to dinner and I asked her, you know, we were celebrating like a, something big happened. I, I think it was the, the end. It's so like, I've just finished a book that I'm going to be launching here in a couple of months called pursuit of legendary fatherhood. And we went out to celebrate and I said, Hey, let me ask you something. I was like, well, where would you and I be without, you know, the dad edge? And my wife didn't even pause. She goes divorced. And I was like, Whoa, really? And she's like, well, She's like, I'm not going to sit here and tell you I had one foot out the door. She goes, but I was hopeful that things would turn around. But I, I, I wasn't sure if it was. And I was starting to plan what my life would look like without you. And I was like, holy freaking crap, man. For my wife to say that, like, dude, that's big, right? So, you know, I, I, for those of you guys who are younger listening to the show, right, you're welcome. <laughs> and you can, you can thank Alex for that amazing advice because that was game changing. But as we end off here, man, I want to make sure that the guys can find everything you're doing, especially like our entrepreneurs, you know, who are very yeah. curious about, about what you do. And uh, we have a lot of guys who are business owners listen, who listen to the show. Um, also uh, guys who are not business owners, you know, who just want to connect with you. What's the best way to do that? 
you know, the best, best place to, to hear more of what I have since you're listening to a podcast, I have a podcast called Momentum for the Entrepreneurial Personality Type. Um, it's one of the top business podcasts in the world. And it's just me, uh, first person sharing usually 10 to 20 minute episodes and each episode solves the problem. And, um, you know, it's meant for entrepreneurs, but it's really meant for the entrepreneurial personality type, people who want to do more, people who want to be more people who live for momentum. So whether you're an entrepreneur or you work in another company and, and you have that personality type where you always want to be moving forward and changing things, you can go to momentumpodcast.com and check out all of the episodes. Um, or you can go to any of the streaming platforms, anywhere the podcasts are found and just type in momentum for the entrepreneurial personality type and you'll find it. I'd love to have you as a listener. Nice. Well, guys, not to worry. We're going to have uh, those links in the show notes for you. So no worries whatsoever. Uh, just head on over to the dadedge.com forward slash 382 for the show. Again, the dadedge.com forward slash 382 for the show. Alex, this was awesome, man. You are the man. I really, really appreciate you coming on and sharing your words of wisdom. Um, appreciate your time, man. Yeah, Larry, you know, th thank you for having me and thank you for what you're doing. You know, when I was, uh, when I had Reagan, there was no dad edge podcast <laughs> and the books that were out there on being a father to girls were lacking at best. Yeah. And, um, and there wasn't a lot of them. And, you know, in preparing for this podcast, I was able to listen to a bit of yours and the information you're putting out there and the way that you interview and the way that you draw out what's important from each guest is absolutely extraordinary. And I'm proud to have been on this podcast, but I'm also, um, I'm so humbled and encouraged by what you do every day, because I think that being an incredible dad is maybe not in the top five for most guys because we've never been told that that's something we should even shoot for. And the fact that you are putting it out there in a way that you are, in a way that's accessible, in a way that um, makes it so that you can really hear it, I, I just, um, I, I'm very grateful for you and for what you're doing. Man, thank you so much. Uh, that seriously, man, means the world. Uh, can you and I schedule a call at 8 a.m. every single morning? You could just say something <laughs> like that. That would, be, that would just be great. So. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that, Larry. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, thank you so much, man. That means the world to me. Guys, like like we were saying, Alex has obviously just got a heart of gold. If you want to connect with him, I'll have all of his links in the show, show notes, uh, his website, as, as well as his social media. Again, head on over to thedadedge.com forward slash 382 for this show. And gentlemen, as always, go out and live legendary. Take care.